Hey, this is Mark Thompson. I'm the voice of Yoda in many of the Star Wars audiobooks, and you are listening to Yodini. You're listening to The Living Force. Be mindful of the living force, young Padawan. A Yutini podcast. Episode 13. Alphabet Squadron Roundtable, Part 2. <laughs> On this episode, social media shoutouts. Going gaga over the Sith Trooper. And Part 2 of our Alphabet Squadron Roundtable. With your hosts. Who are you? Corey Helton, Eric Eilerson, and Charles Hankel. It's gonna be so good. It's gonna it's gonna feel like tasting this uh, this ice cold Miller High Life. Just refreshing. Oh and Look, I've upgraded. I'm drinking. I'm drinking Corona Extra today. Cause you're so extra today. That's why. That's, that's, that's right. We bought it for our Stranger Things party last week, which went really really well. Was that last week? That was two weeks ago. God, we haven't recorded in so long. Man. It's been so long, man. I don't I don't I don't like this. Like I don't ever want to get ahead again. Let's just be behind and stressed out about it because I prefer that to exactly. like not hanging out and talking talking about Star Wars. I agree. We need this to ground ourselves in our lives or else we're going to spiral, man. Roger, Roger. The audience needs it too. And that's good because welcome to episode 13 of the Living Force podcast. I am one of your hosts, Eric Eilerson, and I am joined today by my friend I have not seen in so long, Dr. Corey Helton. What's up, man? Hello. Hello. Uh, And we are unfortunately without... At this moment, at least, Dr. Charles Hankel, uh, real life happened. Yeah. Working that doctor life, man. So we're going to find out if uh, – so while we were recording this, we plan to get together at a certain time. We've already sort of like postponed a good a good amount of time, and Charles is still stuck at the hospital. So we're going we're gonna to see. Uh, he might come in in the middle of this episode. If we, We're going to take a break in the middle to kind of give him a little more time. So we'll, we'll see. He might be in later. If so, then, you know, you're going to get to hear him. But if not – no, may his soul rest in peace. He's kicked off the podcast. <laughs> this, is the, this is the Charles Hankel Memorial episode of the <laughs> podcast. Uh, but yeah, maybe right now he's on his way home. Maybe he's covered in fluids of some sort. I don't know how hospitals oh, work. I hope he's not covered in fluids. Although uh, a lot of patients you know, do look like Jabba the Hutt these days. So. <laughs> Me so look at Charles. It'd be awful. <laughs> um, but before we get into the possibility of Charles returning, we have a bunch of stuff to get to. This is technically our part two of our Alphabet Squadron roundtable. So we'll be getting back to our discussion of that awesome book in a bit. But we had a really great social week this week. So we have a few shout outs we want to uh, throw out here. First of all, we have... Kind of a miraculous, odd shout-out, which is to Timothy Dunlap, uh, who's at Toasted Zen on Twitter. But uh, we've chatted with him a bit on Twitter, but he sought us out on Patreon. This is nuts. I can't believe this this happened. So, um, Timothy, right? Timothy, yeah. Timothy yeah. Dunlap, right? I'm going to uh, – let's, let's – oh, I want to talk to you directly here for a minute. I'm going to try to find your exact – comments that you left here we go he said uh he said i love what you guys are doing a subscribe for you although i do not spend any time on youtube anymore i'll catch you on twitter may the force be with you so timothy i got this notification on youtube um so our, our podcast episodes are automatically posted on youtube through libsyn and stuff that's who we host the podcast with so it's automatically posted we get a occasionally get rare folks will comment on YouTube videos. Um, it's just the audio and, and like a picture, right? So if anybody likes to listen to podcasts, like kind of at a separate window at work or something through YouTube, you can do that. Um, but we don't get a lot of action on there because I think most people are subscribed through iTunes and kind of a traditional stuff. Um, so I got this comment through YouTube from, from Timothy here. And then about five minutes later, I got this notification via email. It says, Timothy uh, Dunlap is now a uh, patron of your Patreon page. And I'm like, what? Wait, wait a minute. All right. So I, I looked it up and uh, Timothy found us on the internet somehow. I don't know that we've ever talked about having a Patreon. No, because it, it's actually kind of a secret Patreon because that's how the uh, the bunch of us split the cost of running the website and, and running the podcast because it's a lot easier than just Venmoing stuff all around. We just said, hey, we'll set up a Patreon. So for hosting fees and stuff like that, us that run all of this can help right. fund it. It's a it's a nice way for us to sort of like for for me who sort of handles all the finances to kind of bill everybody on the team, I guess. Yeah. Like on a monthly basis, so I don't have to just do that. 
Um, and we've always had the intention of pushing Patreon live for the public, right? Because like, I would love to be able to get a little more assistance with the website. Like mm-hmm. uh, the utini.com is fairly expensive to run. I mean, it's, we spend probably a couple hundred bucks a month, I think overall, like mm-hmm. getting everything. There's a lot of different moving parts, basically subscription fees for different things. This we re- we were paying for a software called zoom that we do the podcast with. So we have a significant amount of expenses and I've always wanted to push it live. I just, we haven't talked about it much on the show yet because, you know, we, we don't want to be those guys that are like, Hey, give us all your money. We started a podcast. So you get, you know, so you, we can get you as patrons on our Patreon page. Yeah. Like two episodes in, like before we were like, like we wanted to, we've talked about this quite a bit. We want to grow an audience and then we want to figure out what you guys want to hear more of so we can give you more of that content. But Timothy just jumped the line, found the Utini Patreon and threw a couple bucks a month our way. So which I am so unbelievably impressed yeah, with. So like Timothy, you. you're like you're like my favorite fan ever. Yeah. Like right now. Like and also founding member. For just, just for the record, if you want to be my next favorite man, uh my favorite fan of all time, like I think he I think Timothy is giving us five bucks a month. Six dollars. That's the current <laughs> bid. That's the current bid for my favorite fan. Six dollars a month. We're just Austin style. It's just gonna be up, 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 up. Yeah, yeah. But but seriously, Timothy, thank you so incredibly much. Like it really yeah. seriously means a lot that that we are doing something that that you're enjoying. It means so much to us that like you're willing to you like it so much that you're willing to give us money. Like you know that seriously means a lot, especially because you went so far out of your way to find us and do that. That's awesome. You know, please keep it up. Let us know how we can help you more. Get into Star Wars books if you're not already a diehard fan and uh, shoot your questions our way. We'll make sure to answer them. Absolutely. And we'll be doing an official Patreon launch again in the future on this podcast. But if if you're like Timothy and you want to jump on the bandwagon, kind of help us out early, uh, patreon.com slash Utini is where we are. We'll plug it at the end of the show. Again, we don't have any perks right now. I want to be very transparent that we're not intending a full launch yet, but if you want to be an early adopter, yeah. we'd love that. Yeah, we have some cool plans for that too that we can yeah. kind of go ahead and briefly mention that we've talked, we've kind of bounced around ideas from. We're eventually going to shift, I think, to live stream recordings like or something similar because we're already in a video call now. It wouldn't be that technologically difficult to to stream these, right? So we might do some mm-hmm. sort of after show hangout with with Patreon. Patrons, I'm so bad at using the lingo correctly. With patrons, we might do some sort of after show hangout with patrons. Um, they would get like absolutely would answer all their questions every single episode, that sort of stuff. So we have a lot of cool ideas for Patreon. We're just not quite ready to to really jump forward with that. So like Eric said, if you want to find us on Patreon and give us money, by all means, by all means. just you know, I, yeah. just don't uh, don't expect a whole lot in, in in return exclusively for patrons quite yet. Maybe in the next. Um, I probably shouldn't give too tight of a timeline. Three to six months, I think that's probably yeah. Gonna I think that's pretty tight. But until then, keep chatting with us on Twitter. A bunch of you do, and we've been getting a lot more active on there. We've loved it. Uh, this week, we actually got one really cool comment from Rafaela, who's at Raficha, Rafika. It's a ch. I think it's a Raficha. That said, I can't thank you enough for an episode about one of my favorite Star Wars books, talking about Alphabet Squadron. I loved every second of it, and I can't wait for more next week. I know I'm in the minority because most of the fandom didn't like it as much as I did, so I'm really thankful when I find such great discussion. So mm-hmm. thank you. I I am right there with you in this minority of loving this book so much, uh, as you heard on the last episode, and you'll hear again on this one. So thank you for that comment. That like made, Every yeah. time we see something like that, it really makes our day. It warms our hearts. This- it's It's great. <laughs> Just to comment on this a little bit too, like this exactly what you said, Raffaella, is like why we have the opinions that we have at Utini, yep. right? Like, you know, listen to the very end of the episode. You've never listened to the end of our episodes. We have this whole Utini, um, what, what have we been calling the it? The fan Utini code. fan code. Yeah, we have yeah. a fan code, right? Because like, just because one person dislikes it, you know, I didn't love Alphabet Squadron so far. I've been kind of open about that, but I haven't just like crapped on the book and how awful it is because that's stupid. And my opinion is not the only opinion that matters. So, like, to hear people that 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 loved something in the expanded universe in a different way than I did just warms my heart because that's what you what's what. Utini is all about, and that's what the expanded universe is all about, is sort of finding what it is in the galaxy of Star Wars that you uh, relate with. So thank you so much for that comment, Raffaella. Um, keep them coming. 100%. And to move into another uh, area of our social, we got an email this week from Zach Zorn, which is possibly the greatest name I've heard in weeks, uh, Mr. Mm-hmm. Zorn, double Z. It reads, 
absolutely love the website and the podcast. Thank you a bunch, Zach. And he says, I have a request for an addition to the reading collections or ideal reading order section. Would it be possible to include an ideal list to read that is canon specific and one that is legend specific? And Zach, it's hilarious that you asked this question because for the last year and a half at least, we have all <laughs> been talking about whether this is something we want to do. Because yes. one of the biggest problems in getting into Star Wars books, as we've said a billion times, we'll say it a billion times more, is where do I go first, then where, then where, then where, right? We don't always have that one friend that can kind of help you out. So that's what you teenies are trying to do. Yeah. But so this this it's funny that it's funny that you asked this. This is one of the things that like since I founded UTD in like 2017 that I've been like, guys, we need to do this. And everybody, I've gotten a lot of pushback on the team because like I, I honestly kind of agree with the team now at this point. Like there's not a correct way to read Star Wars books, right? Like that's why our website is laid out in the order that it's laid out. Like we don't say, hey, read all these books. We say, hey, read these first five books and then check out our other collections based on topics of what you like about Star Wars, right? Because there's just so many different ways to do it. Like I just said a few minutes ago, like my opinion doesn't actually matter. Mm -hmm. But that being said, we have maybe found <laughs> found a solution to this problem is what if Corey puts together his list of suggested reading order of Star Wars? That way, nobody else at Utini has to take the blame except Corey if it's in a garbage order. So You, you read know. I, Jedi, and then you read Plagueis. And then yes, you get the, your bookends. The first, <laughs> <laughs> the first step of reading Corey's Star Wars book is you buy all of them, and then you take I, Jedi, and place it directly into the trash. <laughs> <laughs> After you've done that, you take the new Jedi Order series and then place that directly into the trash. <laughs> <laughs> and then you take out the trash because you don't want to overflow. You put a new bag in. Yes. Yes. Uh, you take alphabet squad. I'm just kidding. That's not. Uh, that's, not that's not. That's not funny. That's not funny. Alphabet uh, squadron wasn't wasn't that bad. I, no. Yeah. But anyway, what, what I'm, the point I'm trying to make is like everybody has a very dramatically different opinion about how you should get into Star Wars books, what order you should read them in, and my opinion is going to be different than Eric's six, substantially. So yeah. <laughs> actually, in that specific instance, <laughs> like our our order would probably be very different, ridiculously different. Uh, yeah. Right. 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 So. The idea, long story short, Zach, like we, we probably will do something like this in the foreseeable future. Um, I don't know how long it will be before we do it because this is a pretty big project. But, you know, I have a rough list sort of already kind of in mind that I might just jot down and uh, we'll kind of see where it goes from there. You know, is this something that you want, listeners? Like if you guys are dying to get the Utini suggested reading order, then let us know. Tell us on Twitter. Tell us an email at uh, – Email, Living Force Pod five. at utini.com. Yeah, shoot us an email if this is something that you want to see and that you think that we're stupid for not doing it already, then let us know because we can definitely do it. Tell us what you want, people. <laughs> Tell me what you want, guys. What do you want? Uh, and until then, we are actually doubling down our efforts lately to increase our collections on utini.com already. So we have collections like if you like Darth Vader, read these books. If you like Han Solo, read these books. So if you've been wanting more collections like that, more and more are popping up every day. So just stay tuned to our homepage. Check that out. Yeah, we got some really good ones too. Yeah, that, we got a Claudia uh, Gray one that just went out. Yeah. We got a Zuku one that just went out. Yeah. yeah. There's a lot of really – a Chewy one just yep. went out too. We had a Chewy one go out. Uh, Attack of the Clones, um, yeah, that one went out. Yeah, a lot of really good – man, the team has been kicking butt <laughs> lately. They're so awesome. Um, yeah, there's so many of those coming out. We should probably do a better job each week of talking about what guides are out so we can direct people to You're the You're so too. right. We See, we discover these as we record, listeners. It that's, is all that's right. <laughs> that's right. See, this is why This is why when me and you get together and Charles is not here, it just all goes to shit because <laughs> – Precisely. We, Although, we listeners, no I received a message. Charles is on his way home at this exact moment, so he will be here for the second half of the episode. We're um, going to make it happen. So the last couple things before we get to that part, then we'll take our break and get to the meat of this episode. If you haven't skipped to it already, thank you very much. Um, I wanted to say a quick thank you to a couple shows that will be featured on or have been featured on. Corey and I were lucky enough to go on Inside the Force, which is at Inside the Force a couple weeks ago now. Uh, we had a blast yeah. talking about... It was a ton of fun. God, so much stuff. So much book stuff. Uh, our ideas about the fall of the Jedi... Um, yeah, I met those. I met those guys at uh, celebration last year, mm -hmm. uh, or in April. And um, I, as soon as we we immediately hit it off, they're from not far from me in Kentucky because mm -hmm. I'm in Tennessee, and um, that was a ton of fun. Definitely check out that episode. 
Do you know what episode number it is by chance, Eric? It's 200 and something. It's, it, yeah. If you're listening to this, we're, so you're, we're recording this on July 15th. It'll come out on Thursday. It's maybe two or three episodes back in the Inside the Force feed. Yeah. So go check. Late June, early July, probably something like that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Go check it out on iTunes. Those guys are a lot of fun to listen to also. Absolutely. So. And next week, I'll be on Friends of the Force, which is at Friends of, the For- Friends of Force on Twitter, alongside Alderanian Rose. If you're on Star Wars Twitter, you may have heard of her uh, at Alderanian R. She's a uh, big presence on Star Wars Sessions and a p- couple other podcasts, and we'll be talking all about Alphabet Squadron there. So if you need more Alphabet love and you need me to sing the praises of Will Lark a little more, then next week, I believe, will be the Friends of the Force episode on that. Finally, whew, a lot of shout-outs this week, and I love that because it's all a community, man. This is my favorite part of Star Wars podcasting <laughs> is so the great. giant Star Wars podcast community. Yeah, I love it. Uh, finally, I want to give a huge shout out to the, the guys at Star Wars Sessions, uh, which are the best UK Star Wars podcast. I'll say that. Uh, we, ch- we were chatting a bunch these last few weeks about, over the Women's World Cup. If you haven't been following the Women's World Cup, uh, the US won. So that was great. <laughs> you don't <laughs> say. But there was a day where the US and England were playing each other, and we just got to shit talk each other a ton on Twitter all in good fun during that game. And it was just a blast. Those guys are absolutely legendary. And if you want some great banter and Star Wars news and stuff like that, you got to check out Star Wars Sessions. So thank you guys for being so cool every single week. Now, Corey, we're going to get to this break. We're going to get to Alphabet. But before we do, two more things. One, we got a new trooper design this week for Rise of Skywalker. It was announced that at San Diego Comic-Con, there will be exclusive toys about the Sith Trooper which is an all-red First Order mm-hmm. Trooper, a little <clears throat> reminiscent of some Phase 2 clone armor in there somewhere. Yeah. Uh, I just want your initial thoughts on this, because we got to be, yeah, gotta so be listen, in the know. Let me tell you, there's a lot of talk on on Reddit and stuff about this trooper. He's like, you know, he looks exactly like a lot of other troopers had. Like, why the why the bright red? That makes no sense. Like, the Sith Trooper's already been done and all this stuff, and... Man, I just gotta tell you, those people are so absolutely wrong because the Sith Trooper looks flippin' awesome. Yes. I, I don't know what the endorsed. heck. <laughs> yes, I don't know what the heck they're thinking. Like, honestly, I kind of like my my first initial thought of seeing the pictures is the armor is very aggressive looking. Yeah, like, have you noticed that? Angular. Like, angular. It's very sharp. Yes, very mm-hmm. angular, very sharp. It looks kind of like the Death Troopers a little bit. Like it's mm-hmm. those sharp ang- angles and stuff, and it reminds me of like older public stuff. So I actually love it, man. I can't wait to see what it is and what the heck does it mean, Sith I, Trooper? I think it's. I think it's got to. So I'm, we're not huge speculators on this podcast, as you guys have known. We like to wait for information and then talk about it. But for Sith Troopers, for me, I agree. I love the design. I think they're going to be an elite squad. And with Kylo Ren saying, you know, we have to let the past die, right? Let the Sith and the Jedi die. I think after Rey said, no, I won't join you, maybe he said, okay, fine. Then I'm going to double down and go back into the Sith, into the Sith artifacts. Because, like, in the Galaxy's Edge comic, he's looking for a Sith artifact of some kind. So maybe he's looking for holocrons. Maybe Mm -hmm. that's something to do with it. But regardless, I I love the design. If anyone is going to San Diego Comic-Con and wants to pick up that Funko Pop... Uh, I'd love that. <laughs> Tweet at us. Get at me. Um, yeah, seriously. It just looks so um, yeah, fun. Uh, one of my favorite things about all these new troopers since they're coming out is we get to see them like in various mediums across the expanded universe. Like the Death Trooper showed up in Rebels, um, mm-hmm. and like they had a whole little cool thing where they were in Rebels and stuff. And I absolutely love seeing like these new troopers show up in different places because they're awesome. And I can't wait to see them in a book or a comic. We haven't got a whole lot of Death Trooper stuff since Rogue One, but we've gotten a little bit, and it's been cool. Yeah. So very excited about that. Uh, Living Force Podcast officially endorses the Sith Trooper. We love it. Yep. And last thing, the one last thing I wanted to talk about is a while back I said I was going to read Rogue Squadron, and I finished it. I finished the first book, and I wanted to just kind of give a little uh, shout out to Rogue Squadron for being a good book. I didn't love it. I thought it was good. It was. Yeah, I I enjoyed it. I'm surprised you didn't love it, but you loved Alphabet Squadron. Exactly. But I realized, I think that Rogue Squadron was more more plot-based, which was a big complaint about Alphabet Squadron, especially within our team, right? Mm -hmm. And Rogue was a lot more about the plot machinations and about some more, a lot more technical stuff. And I felt like I didn't quite know each character once we got out, because there were like 12 of them. And then like when one or two died, I was like... I'm, oh, that I got. That's a bummer. But it didn't. It didn't 
hit me in a way because I didn't feel that close sure. connected to them. But I thought it was written very well. It's very much Legends. It it, it is. It is very illuminating to see. Now that's Legends Starfighters, and Alpha Squadron is kind of canon Starfighters. I, I can see the the difference. So I'm I'm probably gonna check out the rest of the series at some point. It didn't make me immediately want to go to the next one. I know Charles is is screaming in the car on his way here right now, like <laughs> hearing me say that through the force. But I'm not gonna rush out to get book two. I, I, I it was a lot of fun. It was solid. But man, I honestly have a lot of uh, a lot of canon books that are piling up on the bookshelf here, so yeah, I don't got seriously. time to go back in those legends right now. Interesting, interesting. I'll be excited to hear how you, your thoughts sort of compare to Alpha Squadron as we get into part two. Yeah, yeah. So we are going to get to that right after this break. We're going to take a quick, quick little rest here from Utini member. We're going to get Charles in here, and then we will continue with our thoughts on Alpha Squadron. Be right back. <laughs> Hello there, scruffy-looking nerf herders. Matt here, podcast editor for the Living Force Podcast. Now, for the past dozen episodes, you've heard Utini members talk about their favorite Star Wars EU novels and reading experiences. I want to talk with you about my favorite comics. Star Wars Vader Down is a six-issue crossover released in 2015 between Marvel's flagship title and the Darth Vader series. This project was co-written by Jason Aaron and Kieran Gillen and features the Dark Lord of the Sith on his own, facing off against the Rebel Army. Now, if you love the hallway scene at the end of Rogue One, you will love how Vader is presented in Vader Down, and the end of the story arc gives Star Wars fans a very big reveal. So check out Vader Down, which you can find in trade paperback form at your favorite comic sites. And to learn more about Star Wars in comic book form, look for the Utini Guide to Comics coming soon to utini.com. May the Force be with you. So you've rushed here, Charles. You're in your scrubs. The question is, is it going to be worth it? It's going to be worth it. I I was, <laughs> you know, just saying I was looking forward to this all day and life and work was trying to make me miss this, but I wasn't going to let it happen. So I'm here. I'm ready for my weekly dose of living force. And uh, mm. all you who are listening, you are complying with doctor's orders to have one weekly dose of living force <laughs> podcast. That is Listen. right. I cannot. I cannot wait until we have this. Cause I, I kind of like this. Like one person gets to drop in like this. Like we can make this work, right? I can't wait till one of us is like on call or something and like doing this recording from a call room, <laughs> and they get, we, we get paged in the middle of the talk. Be like, listen, guys, this has been fun. I gotta go. I'll see you guys later. Nah, man, just throw that, that on speaker while you're doing compressions. It's all good. That's we, that's we gonna happen. We get claxons going off and everyone running around. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Uh, but yes, uh, folks, as you can hear after that particularly marvelous clip that we just heard, uh, Dr. Charles Hankel has made it back. Oh, fr- st- again, still wearing scrubs, still wearing that smile, so ready to talk about Alphabet Squadron because that needed to happen. Hmm. Welcome back. Yeah, I gotta say, Charles, the teal scrubs look good on you, man. They do. You wear them well. Hey. Thank you. I appreciate that. I'm I'm doing my best. Um, it's probably good that you guys can't see me too closely because, like I said, I'm kind of a hot mess, man. But it's all right. Yeah, yeah. We we already talked about the types of fluids you might be covered in. Um, yeah. I, I did in, I did inform Eric that you know these days there are a large number of patients that are reminiscent of Jabba the Hutt. So that's true. I wonder what Jabba's BMI was. One <laughs> hundred? Is that a thing? Oh man. Maybe, Pro- maybe probably very very high i don't know the huts you know funny enough there's actually a good bit of like biology about huts in the expanded yeah, and the christian yeah, books they have hearts, yeah. right they have two hearts yes it, get, it gets it gets talked about like an abnormal amount I for think, some reason yeah. i, I want to say and eric you read this more recently i want to say isn't there like a hut with heart failure yeah in some of the crispin stuff yeah like one of them isn't working anymore or... yeah and then they and they get like uh they, the poison that they use to kill that head, I think, causes it to go into something like cardiac arrest. Yeah, yeah. I I, ba- I vaguely remember that. So yeah, I and also it. they're like super hard to kill because you have to like if you shoot them or stab them, like they're the organs are so far in that you yeah. it, they're like you have to just yeah. keep stabbing them over and over and over again. Yeah, or just use a chain around the neck. Works See, every time. That's true. We saw it. Uh, Which actually is fairly impressive, considering how much blubber there is around. It's that. incredibly <laughs> impressive. The, the fact that Leia did that is pretty cool. We know we need to do a uh, you know at some point we're gonna have to out of obligation do a Star Wars medicine episode, right? Oh my god, we absolutely. I will. guess so. 
there's there's a good deal of that. Not a whole lot in canon. There's the whole uh, space blood illness BS. Blood burn, yeah. <laughs> Well, there was whatever uh, that's in. There was Claudia the uh, bad guy in last Claudia shot, Gray. whatever his name was. He was a surgeon, right? I mean, he yep. was like, yeah, that's true. Yeah. One of you, that's true. And uh, and uh, uh, Ponda Baba and his uh, Doctor Evazon. Doctor Doctor Evazon. Doctor yeah. Evazon. Yeah, he was the crazy surgeon too. So there's a good there's a good number of doctors and stuff. And um, we'll do it. Throw it in the queue. All right. Yeah, but before that, guys, we gotta get back to Alphabet Squadron because yes, we do, listeners. Now we are recording week of, but for a bit we've been trying to get ahead of the schedule, so we've been backlogging episodes. So we, it was two weeks ago, we talked about Alpha Squadron the first time. So Charles, bring us back. Where, where were we? What were we talking about with the best squadron there has ever been? Um, well, assuming I remember what Alphabet Squadron was about, <laughs> I believe, <laughs> I believe that we left off. Speaking about all of the individual members, and I do believe, if I'm not mistaken, that we left off with Eric's favorite member of Alphabet Squadron, none other than A-Wing pilot Will Lark. Oh, we did. Will's so, marvelous. You've been, di- you've been dying to talk about Will since we like first started, <laughs> started reading, reading this book. book. Like, I was like, guys. <laughs> two months ago or something. Yeah, yeah er- Eric is basically guardian of the Will. Um, so. <laughs> I accept it. I will tattoo it on my chest, my naked <laughs> chest. And here we are again. <laughs> um, Poop right. on the chest. Poop. <laughs> so this is already entirely off the rails. Um, so Will Lark, to talk about him, he's one of the surviving members of Riot Squadron, who was basically a whole squadron of A wings who was fighting for the New Republic. They were actually involved. Um, at the Battle of Endor, which I think is pretty awesome. Will was there. Mm-hmm. Um, let's talk about the, where Will came from, his home world a little bit. Um, it was really his main focus throughout the entire story. It was a world that he just called home, capital H home. I believe it is it Polynius? Uh, Polynius. Or Polynius? I mean, according to the Polynius. audiobook, yeah. All right. So Polynius, um, what did you guys think about hearing about his home world and some of the culture that it described. It it reminded me a lot of Pandora from Avatar. Uh, yes. Because they like fly on those beasts and that's how they learn to fly is with the animals of the planet. And it was very much like a, um, like, like a tribe mentality of everyone kind of helps raise everybody. Everyone's connected. Uh, they're very close to the earth and things like that. Uh, so it, it really just reminded me of that. It was, I I and I, and get- I love the visuals of that movie. That was one of my favorite movies for years, honestly. So it really got me into his kind of mindset. Dances with Wolves animated edition. Anyway, um, so yes. uh, have <laughs> <laughs> have you guys have you guys read uh, Phasma? Mm-hmm. I have not. So Phasma talks all about her home planet, which is this very sort of weird backwater planet with a sort of tribal mentality and i thought it reminded me a lot of i mean when will was talking that's kind of the stuff i was picturing was similar stuff that uh was occurring in the yeah yeah i could see that yeah i I thought it was very interesting um i will say that like for will to be from such a interesting cultural place like he doesn't i don't think it reflects him a lot like he doesn't other than his sort of rem you know his memories and his reminiscences on, uh, on on thinking about his home world and stuff. Mm-hmm. Like his whole the whole idea of being from like that avatar riding animal type of primitive almost culture. It didn't come through. I don't think very much. Does that make sense? Am I making sense at all? You you are, and I, and I think that there's there's a possibility of it clashing with like the animals versus the tech, right? Like we're flying sure. animals, and then so how does that mean you can fly starships, kind of thing? And I mm-hmm. think for me, it came out in the way he talked to his ship, right? It even, he even got mocked by other people in his squadron for it because he treated mm-hmm. his ship almost like a living being. And I think yeah. that's where it, that that I see. Yeah, you're right. That came yeah, through a little connected. bit. I'm just I'm really thinking more about like, like you know how the people in Avatar are like are like the Indians in Pocahontas. Yeah, like yeah, like they they actively they, they, don't like technology. They kind of actively right. are against it. Yeah, they're actively against it. They're super primitive. They're mm-hmm. like they don't have technology at all. Like that's kind of how Will described it, in my mm-hmm. opinion. At least that's kind of what I gathered from it. But that's like it just seems bizarre that that's where he's from. Does, does that make sense? I yeah. think it does. I think another thing that is interesting is that 
you know, you find out that he comes from this very, let's call it a backwater planet where, you know, there's a very specific culture. I think it's interesting that you find someone who is as accepting as Will Lark and as open to all other cultures yeah. when he's coming <clears throat> from such a closed off environment, if that makes sense. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, cause Will, you're, you're, you're so right, man. Like Will is, is very accepting of everyone. He, he always wants to listen to the stories everyone tells. He always kind of wants to know what everyone's point of view is and let them know he's there for them, like to, to a fault at some points, especially with Chas, right? He wants to open up mm-hmm. a little too much and she's like, get the hell away from me. <laughs> and I think that's interesting because I think the easy writing trick, you're, you're totally right, would be to have the person from the, the planet that is closed off to be closed off. They are re- representative of that. Yeah. So flipping that on its head, I thought was a fun writing convention to be like, oh, right. Like, that's my it preconception. Was. And it's also reader. interesting because he's a human, right? Yeah. So like, like different cultures and different alien species is no new concept in star wars there's tons and tons of alien species with all these crazy cultural norms and language things and like like you know back on their planet they do things their way like there's a lot of hive mentality mm-hmm. uh like hot hive mind type of uh aliens like the genosians the verpine like there's lots of crazy stuff like that already in star wars and like will doesn't really seem like that mm-hmm. like he seems like a totally normal guy that just got dropped from this ultra primitive place that he's from into like the greater galaxy and he fits in really, really well, which is maybe that's why it's so bizarre to me because like we get lots of other kind of weird cultures in Star Wars and they're always like really primitive. They have difficulty understanding language. They always sound like a certain way, like they, mm-hmm. they speak choppy basic, I guess, and stuff. And so it's just weird to me that he's from like this, you know, Avatar backwards planet. But he seems so normal, I guess. So maybe it just rubbed me funny. But yeah, I think no. it was it was interesting for me, kind of seeing how Will saw the beauty in every in every different kind of scenario, right? Like he, and I think that's that's actually very different in Star Wars because we we as people that are seeing Star Wars, we can see how the Falcon's beautiful to us because and and we can see how like oh Tatooine, right? It's got this kind of mystique to it. But if you're in it, it all kind of sucks. Like, it's all dirty and bullshit. Yeah. Like, and I <laughs> right. think that Will is is almost acting more as, as a, a watcher or a reader being like, I can find the beauty in this. I can find the, you know, the song of the universe, whatever it might be. And one last thing I want to add to the to the community that I really loved about the planet is that when the Empire came, how they all kind of mutually agreed that they needed to send pilots to go help. Be- that's super yeah. interesting yeah like yeah. It, they said it wasn't written down it wasn't a message they just all kind of spoke it amongst themselves that yeah. we are the best flyers mm-hmm. in the galaxy and it is our duty yeah. to send away our people which is something they would never do right because straight up hunger game style too by yeah. the way yeah 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 man yeah. everybody like every every like I how was it described tribute. Right, yeah, every individual group of like different cult I don't know what they are. Are they tribes? I don't know. Yeah, like really each individual tribe, much. like the river, uh the tree, like whatever they were called, they all had to send yeah. a couple people and it, knowing they'd probably never go home again. And I'm like, that's right. an interesting thing about, you know, on on the bigger scale of sacrificing your own well well being for people you've never met and probably will mm-hmm. never meet, but because it's the right thing to do because suffering exists so even though it's not really affecting me on a personal level i will still help and i'm like that's a right. really beautiful sentiment yeah and just one other thing i, I want to mention is i really love when you get tiny little tie-ins into the main story or the to the main characters i don't like when it feels shoehorned right but there was a really nice uh moment where when the empire i guess first got to Polinius that um they sent a uh, ambassador, I guess, from Polinius to go see the emperor. And I don't know if y'all recall this, but he was he disappeared and was never heard from again. The guy that they sent from Polinius. So oh, I guess right. the emperor killed him or or had him dispatched. And I thought that was just a nice little subtle thing that kind of tied Will's background to the empire yeah. at large and the emperor on a totally. personal level. Yeah, good catch. Now, Eric, you mentioned that you think that that Will was talking to his ship like it was a sentient being because that's what he was used to where he grew up. Corey, did you feel similarly? Or had you not even thought about that? Uh, I mean, I thought it kind of made sense. Like, 
I don't know if I um I don't I'm trying to remember how I was feeling actually reading it. It was so long ago at this point. Um, I don't think that I specifically remember being like, oh, it's like his horse. Like, I don't think I ever had that thought. Like, <laughs> like you know what I mean? Like, I, I don't think I, yeah, exactly. I don't think I ever thought like that. I mean, I kind of just looked at it as like, I don't know. Ships have historically always been feminized, right? Mm-hmm. Like, I- even in like real uh, world history, right? Not not Star Wars. <laughs> like in in real world history, like people have often talked about vehicles and ships specifically, which like the Navy mm-hmm. have, has always sort of had like a female character, like almost a human component to it. Yeah, like, like she'll get you home, at, and like you know she's a fighter. It, like, yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, and that, that goes back like a long, long ways. Even early airplanes, they would paint crazy things on the sides of them and mm-hmm. give them crazy names and stuff. So I kind of looked at it like that, which is. Very fighter pilot kind of thing to yeah. me, so yeah, that makes sense. Uh, yeah, I like that. I mean, heck, even with my car, you know, like if you you know when your car is making a weird noise, you just kind of give the dashboard a tap and be like, oh come on, come on, no no no, <laughs> no no no, I can't afford this right now. Like you like I've talked to my yeah. car. I don't know. I, I'm sure everyone does that, right? That's a normal thing. I just I just swear at mine a lot when it doesn't do what I want. Will would never well, swear at his ship. No, never. <laughs> But he he speaks to ship. He speaks to other people too. And mm-hmm. one excerpt from the book that I think really spoke to his character a lot was when he broadcasted on an open channel to the Tie Fighters, uh, the enemy Tie Fighters who were actively hunting him and his crew. And I'm just curious, what did you guys think about that moment? What do you think? What kind of insight did that give us into Will's character? That in a moment of recess from active combat that he would reach out and try and speak and relate to his enemy i think it was a, it was a, i will say that was a great scene yeah like that that whole scene was really, really cool and like i think i uh i feel like i kind of saw where it was going like a little bit so if you haven't read the book there's the the scene in which charles is talking about like they're like in space and there's a sort of an ongoing battle going on but they end up both sort of both like the uh riot squadron and the other rebels and the empire end up with a lot of downtime with the ships or uh, both sides just kind of fly around in space and will like broadcast on an open channel hoping that the imperials will kind of talk to him back and this guy does and he tells this legend of like the nebula or something that they're like hanging out in and stuff mm-hmm. yeah the Orid all and, cluster <clears throat> yeah yeah right right and then at the very end of his whole of whole he's talking about like do you guys remember the details like it's like the cluster is some kind of god and yeah, legend like it's a sentient, like some people say it's a being and it has desires and it has like it speaks to people and things like that and then he's right. like it, uh like the cluster is gonna hear you die or something right like it's not something like good thing that's a legend because the cluster is gonna eat your face and crush yeah. you into oblivion because yeah. the empire rules and you suck it's just like yeah. kind of and over then the they, top like, they and... literally play propaganda messages like i'm assuming like you know like hitler level speeches over the channel and, yeah. and it was such a it was a really hard scene to read actually and then to listen to an audio uh, alex damon from star wars explained tweeted out when when he was reading this book uh, the page number about this scene and said, uh, hey, this is where I fell in love with this book was this scene. And and I agreed to an extent because reading it was really kind of the most vulnerable I think I've seen a Star Wars character in a long time about saying, you know what? We've been reading a lot of stories lately with, with Inferno Squad and other things, mm-hmm. even this one about Imperial Defectors and they're actually not all bad guys and maybe like they all kind of right. wanted out. And that scene was a really nice fake out because it was like, yeah, oh, yeah, I want to talk to you, but, but no. These guys are. They're real Imperials. Yeah. Like, they, yeah. they want to kill you because they're evil. And, right? and I think there's a moment now, again, to bring it into a bigger picture about the world right now. A lot of people want to believe that, you know what, if someone on the other side of me, whether it's politically or whatever it is, if I just speak to them with compassion and love, they'll actually respond in kind. And sometimes, no. Sometimes it, they right. literally just hate you. And it's like, it, and it was... And I think maybe because of what's going on in the world right now that it hit me a little harder personally because I was like, man, God, he no, he did everything right. He he is trying to reach out and is trying to stop bloodshed and sometimes it, that's just not enough. And that right. was really sad. It's really well written. <laughs> man, that's, that's deep. I love that. My next question, I'm just going to ask you guys straight up, okay, before we move on from Will, 
will will survive this trilogy because he is just so intent on making it home again and if that just doesn't seem like the perfect way to break all of our hearts is to not let him get there so will he survive yes or no they're gonna they're gonna they're gonna burn his planet so he lives but his planet and culture die oh my god wait does he want to does he try to take Alphabet Squadron back home to see Polinius, and they get there, and it's been cindered. Yeah, it's been cindered, man. I think this was going to oh. happen. That would be that would be terrible, but oh a really God. great sort of that would be a great tie to get everything together with his with his backstory. Wow. I think. All right, yeah, burn them. Oh. I'm basically the Imperial God. right now. Yeah, no, I think that's it. I mean, I don't know if that's going to happen, but I think that's the gut punch of that is. Is pretty hard. That suck. I yeah. will say that the whole his Will's entire sort of emotional response to the open channel broadcast thing was done really, really well. Like it was just like I think one of his other squadron mates like reached out and was like, "Hey, man, are you okay?" Basically, because that was it was like the the transition from the guy talking about like this cool legend and Will feels like he's reaching this guy to him being like and we're going to cut your throat and rip out of your guts like it was like really staunch yeah. right so and it like really messed with Will's head and it was done really really well that was cool so if if we can capture that emotion like in an Alderaan being destroyed context then that might be super interesting yeah oh and i think maybe there's something to we talked about nath a lot last episode right like nath and will's friendship and relationship getting a lot closer yeah. maybe there's a moment where nath has to be the one after will sees polinius gone to be like hey kid like you're you're okay like don't mm-hmm. don't let this change you because i think nath is going to see will start to go down like his path of cynicism right. and hatred and i think nath is gonna have to be the one that pulls him back because I think I like Will that. might have the moment of like I need to burn them all, like you know, because he's what like nineteen, I think. Yeah, he's young. Um, he seems young. He seems young. Yeah. Uh, oh, also a little small shout out. Uh, Will's gay, and it's not made a big thing. And I think that's oh, yeah. Like, that, I forgot yeah, about that. Yeah, they just all talk about true. like uh, Na- Na- she's like, oh, Chas is mad at me, and Nath is like, what? Just sleep with her boyfriend, and it's just like a thing. And I think that's mm-hmm. really that was really cool, like. It, it sucks that still has to kind of be an addressed thing, but I thought that was handled really casually and really well. So shout out. No, I kind of, I honestly think it kind of needs to be addressed and that we should address it as a, an expanded universe podcast, mm-hmm. because this is not the first time this happened. Like, uh, uh, Wendig made big headlines when he put the first gay character ever in star Wars. And one of the big criticisms of that is because it was so in your face in that book. Like th- there was like a whole scene d- designed around it in a mm-hmm. way. And that's been a major, major criticism. And like, you know, I, I can definitely see both sides of it. You know, if if you're gonna argue that there shouldn't be gay characters in Star Wars, like you're wrong. Sorry, yeah. like there's gay people, there's gay people in real life. There has to be in Star Wars, right? It's a gigantic galaxy that uh, nobody would ever argue that a human and a Twilight shouldn't be together. That's stupid. Exactly. Right? So whatever. That's that's my formal opinion. Hate me if you want to. Um, but like, in my opinion, it doesn't need to be something that we have to make a big deal out of it every single time. And the way it was done in this book, I think was was very appropriate. It wasn't. It didn't call attention away from away from the book yeah. at all to be some sort of uh, agenda. Does that make sense? Yeah, like, yeah it, was, it was handled yeah. like a romance, and I think that's like it does. It was just who he is, and it was it was a part right. of, and like like same with Erica. She's bisexual, and, and it, it was handled in a way of like she mentioned her first girlfriend and in, in a memory, mm-hmm. and that was it. And then then, then yeah. it moved on. Like it was a really naturalistic way that a, that a person in in the queer community would would talk about their past just casually right and i think that right freed should really be applauded for for th- right throwing that in there and, and having that be part of the characters so also if yeah. we could get will if will could settle down with a nice guy like god can <laughs> that would make you so happy he, he needs, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm just so afraid now his planet's gonna be destroyed Corey. like i hadn't thought about it <laughs> and now i'm just so worried for poor will's heart yeah. he's been through so much yep yeah. I just I just don't care about the whole <sighs> any liberal agenda that's somehow hidden in the expanded universe. That is just such a silly concept to me. And I could care less about it. Even if there is an agenda, I don't care. Yeah. Just give me more yeah. Star Wars. If, books, it, although if like your agenda is like to show people that they're also in Star Wars and everyone's kinda nice to each other. All right, is that sorry? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I don't know. Yeah. So yeah, but team will to to round this up. 
Hardcore Team Will. Team Will. Right. Um, Absolutely. I think that planet thing, Corey, you're right on. I do think he's going to survive because I think it's too easy for him to die. I think, I think in, in Legends, he would have died. But I think in yes. canon... I don't know. I, I agree with that. Um, I think that it's almost... They're, I think they're being too obvious about it. Like, that he's always talking about home. He almost died, like, a couple of times in this book. Yeah. Like, he yeah, almost died yeah, he when did. they did like, the whole, at least, like, mine uh, training mission. Mm-hmm. And I think that I think that Alexander Freed is just messing with us. And yeah. He's going to end up surviving. But someone else is going to die in his stead. That is oh, yeah. And, and, they, and they keep talking about, like, Will is, I think... I would argue, not just because I love him, but because of the, what the book says, probably the best natural flyer in the squad. Yeah. I think like Nath, Nath talks about it a lot, about how good the kid is at flying, and Chas respects him. I, th- I think that purely on skill, I think Will has the, the... Maybe that'll be it. Maybe like it'll be a really tough maneuver to escape, and like the Y-Wing is a little too slow, so Nath goes, and Will could pull a quicker maneuver and escape and he and then he has that survivor's guilt or something i can see it it's gonna hurt whatever happens it's gonna hurt me it will <laughs> there will be heartbreak but let's go ahead and shift gears let's talk about the next member of alphabet squadron who is chas nachotic she is the b-wing pilot she is the only surviving member if you're sensing a theme of hound squadron which was a group of b-wings who fought alongside riot squadron which was will squadron now, Chas is supposedly a felon. That mm-hmm. is her alien race. And that's the same race as Latsrazi from the Clone Wars, if you remember her, one of the bounty hunters. Now, we're told that that species as a whole is looked down upon by essentially everyone else in the galaxy. So how do you think that that fact, uh, how did that help to form the personality that we see Chas display in this book? Let's let's talk a little bit more about about. Thielen in general Mm -hmm. like so does this show up anywhere in in the films i'm looking at a picture here uh one of the dancers has like neon pink hair and pink skin yeah Yeah. she's a Thielen. yeah she has a mohawk right is it that one yeah kind uh Uh, i don't know if it's a mohawk i'm looking at the picture here so this this chick is like she's got pink isn't it risotti or something like that I don't know. She's definitely a. Um, I got, I've gotten her a lot in the trading card app. That's like that's yeah. what I know her from. Interesting. Yeah, she's a. She's definitely. It's a humanoid species. Mm-hmm. She's got like crazy hair. It's they have sort of twilight looking facial features. Some weird sort of horn things. Yeah, out of their not head. quite look, rack, they, but definitely horns. Yeah, they look very exotic. Mm-hmm. Um, they do. Who is this chick from the Clone Wars? I don't remember this. This girl. She at all. ran around with Boba, I think. Young Boba. Yeah, yeah the bounty hunter uh, in the episodes when. Uh, Asajj leaves and tries to be a bounty hunter for a bit. She's uh-huh. one of the people in that squad. Yeah, she actually okay. pops up in Dark Disciple as well. Oh no, shit! Oh, yeah. Whenever, whenever Asajj kind of links back up with Boba for a little bit in that book, um, oh, right. Lats is still part of his crew. Yeah, yeah. She's got like bright purple skin yeah. and stuff. So anyway, yeah. they're humanoid. Yeah. They're and Chas, purpley. Chas has a. She described she has a green mohawk, and she's got. What was it? What was her skin? I was like, like a, was it caramel? What was, what was the word? They used a word that was similar to that. Like she was like a light skinned woman of color. I don't remember exactly the word, but yeah. So, but the green mohawk was continuously mentioned. Um, anyway, that's that's who this was. Charles, did you ask us a question? Yeah, like, how, <laughs> I mean, does... so her species essentially, or her her alien race, is looked down upon supposedly. <laughs> by most of the rest of the galaxy and we're not told why and i I imagine we might get that answer eventually but how do you think that that informed chas's character and how she Mm, acted in in terms of other people well she's she's like definitely super like edgy and like i'm getting a lot of like really edgy goth emo vibes kind of from her Mm -hmm. i guess is and and i think it fits her perfectly i mean that's like that's like the mantra of that sort of stereotype, right? They feel like they're exiles. And mm-hmm. so, like, I thought it fit perfectly. And I'm really glad that they did this with an alien and not just, like, a very generic, you know, humanoid mm-hmm. or, or human female specifically. That, that, they could have done that. It could have went just a 
really emotional teenage girl kind of and they didn't it was this cool exotic alien species and i liked it yeah no i really love that for her i think that um matt heads up i think she's got a really cool fuck you attitude um <sighs> that she wears from day one and then we get to see the little moments of vulnerability and like the pain that has crafted her both from charles like you were saying of her exile from society coupled with losing her squadron twice over right Mm -hmm. yeah so i mean i'm a sucker for the trope of the person like i have all these walls up and slowly they go away slowly they go away slowly they go away but what i think they do really well with her is that her walls go down for the squadron a little bit but she never loses power when she does that because she's still like listen will we're good now but you never get to take away my shot again like, she reminds me that you don't get to make decisions for me. Like, we're good. I respect you. I'm not angry anymore. But we still have to learn from this. As opposed to saying, like, yeah, I was overreacting and, like, you know, kind of backing so, down. So let's talk about that for a second because I was going to get there eventually. Chas more or less despised Will or seemed to despise Will because he saved her life. Mm -hmm. essentially he kept her from sticking around in a battle that was going to be lost that she was going to die in but at the same time she tells a story about how Jin Erso shout out to to Rogue One how Jin Erso saved her life and she essentially was like enamored with Jin Erso for what she had done so why does she hate Will and idolize Jin Erso I think with Will It's that he took away any choice she had of staying. I think with with Jin, if I remember correctly, she was kind of helpless and Jin came in and saved her from a situation, like, period. Whereas Will took away the option she had because Chas was choosing to stay and fight. She was choosing to stay by her squadron. And he said, no, you don't get to do that. I'm ripping that away from you and saving your life whether you like it or not. And I think that... It's it's the idea of if I want to sacrifice myself, I should be allowed to, like Jin Erso did, you know? Okay. Like she eventually right. sacrificed herself, but she made that decision. If I'm going to die, that's on me. And I think that yeah. from the outside, we can say that's that's kind of a ridiculous decision if your friend is saying that because you're like, no, like, come on, think about more people other than yourself. Other people need you, et cetera, et cetera, where, where I think they eventually get – but at the moment, I think it's the feeling of Jin gave her power back and Will took her power away. Yeah, I can well see said. that. I'm also going to say that like, I really like when members of the Rebel Alliance talk about why they're in the Rebel Alliance. Yeah. Like, that's always... Is it, <clears throat> let me rephrase it a little bit. It's not cool when they do that. It's cool when really dark gritty individuals talk about why they're in the rebel alliance because like one of the coolest things in one of the coolest scenes i think in rogue 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 one which is my favorite star wars film is that whole scene when when cassian is talking about like how that even though the rebel alliance like disagrees with with her and it's not going to make a move like they like volunteer to go to scarif and stuff and he's like some of us all of us have done awful stuff in the name of the rebellion like we were assassins and saboteurs and all this crazy stuff. I love that entire scene because it's like you have these really dark individuals who are willing to like, you know, go deep undercover and friggin' murder somebody because it might have some gain for the rebellion. But they also believe in this really noble cause, right? Like they believe in like, like this greater, you know, ridding the galaxy of the, you know, uh, tyranny of the empire and you have individuals who are really dark like chas is who, who come across as a super edgy emo thing emo individual but they're also buying into this whole noble rebellion thing which seems very out of character for them so like i've always liked it when when we get to see these like the darker people that have darker sort of personalities we get to see you know they are still they still have the same mission right and it's not to defeat the empire just because they like murder and fools right i mean it's because they want to rid the galaxy of the evil that is the empire yeah i mean i think yeah. i think cassian like you were saying really embodies that the most like i i hate killing people like i i will do it but i hate it you know yeah. and that's i think that is a very awesome point of view that we're getting a lot with new star wars you're totally right you know you guys both mentioned how kind of dark and edgy chas is and one way that i think alexander freed got that across to the reader was with 
the music that she listened to in the cockpit, which yeah. was so unique. Because What did you guys think about this? Because I'd never even thought about that there's a music system in these ships. Right. I mean, there's got to be, right? There, I mean, there's speakers for comms and, and there's things like that. And I thought it was a cool choice because, I mean, shit, when I'm at the gym and I'm like, I need to run on the treadmill and I'm exhausted, I'll throw on music and it just gets you pumped. So why wouldn't that same thing work in this situation? I think it was such a cool, unique part of her character. And if you guys have seen on Twitter at all, Alexander Freed's been retweeting a lot of Chas playlists. People have put together their own Spotify <laughs> nice. playlist. They're like, because he's never said what it was based on because he wants people to make up their own. So that's that's a fun uh, afternoon if you ever want to go check that's out cool. people's Chas and Chatic playlists. Interesting. We should find one and like share it and stuff on Twitter. Totally. <clears throat> yeah. Um, yeah, I thought, I thought that was pretty cool, the whole music thing. I definitely fit the vibe. It never occurred to me that that could happen, but it makes total sense, like you said. I mean... Thought it was pretty cool. Yeah. All right. Now uh, I, I was I, I was picturing sort of sorry I was interrupt I was picturing sort of like the punch dance scene from uh, <laughs> Dirty Dancing. <laughs> like, <laughs> That's exactly oh. what it was like. You nailed it. Yeah. Basically. <clears throat> so I want to take it from kind of that lighter question to a heavier question. This is how we're going to round out talking about Chas. Oh man. She seems very much to me to be preoccupied with the idea of martyrdom mm -hmm. in the name of the New Republic or really in the name of the death of the Empire, okay? She looks up to martyrs of the past. She wonders about if she'll be remembered when she's in the midst of battle. And she frequently does things that, quite frankly, seem very reckless in the middle of battle in the hopes of pulling off some crazy maneuver and winning a major victory. Do you think that she wants to become a martyr herself and die for the cause? Because that's the vibe that I'm getting from her. So this and, is this is like a super profound. This is a super profound deep question, Charles. You obviously is. thought about a lot. So I want to hear what you have to say about this first. Well, I mean, I kind of alluded a little bit to it there, but like she really does to me seem preoccupied. Like when she talks about Jyn or so, yes, she does talk about how she you know, is a huge fan, if you will, of her because she saved her life. Okay. And, and that might make you think, well, then no, she I'd doesn't want to die. She doesn't want to be martyr. <laughs> yeah, it makes sense. Right. But really what she talks about more so than that is about how Jen gave everything to the cause that she believed in. And she doesn't just mention Jen and it's been long enough now that I've forgotten who else, who else she's mentioned, but she also, when Will talks about the Battle of Endor, you know, and, and all yeah, the she's people obsessed who died with the at Death the Battle Star, of man. Endor, yeah, she, you know, she's enamored by these people who gave everything for the cause. And then I, I, I look at that and I look at it next to the crazy stuff that she does in these books that just seems to have no no intent of self-preservation. And it just all ends up equaling, I think she wants to die in the name of the Republic, not to mention that she was angry at will, like we talked about earlier, for keeping her from doing that very thing. What if she sacrifices herself to save Will? See, this is what I'm saying. Someone else is going to die in Will's stead. And it, you're very right. It could be Chas. That would be perfect for her character you, arc. You know what she reminds me of? She reminds me of Lieutenant Dan from Forrest Gump. <laughs> Lieutenant Dan! Because, yeah. like, remember, like... You got legs, Lieutenant like, Dan! He gets so angry at Forrest for saving him in Vietnam, right? He's like, I'm supposed to die on the field, like, all of my family, and all this kind of thing. But eventually lives the life and realizes, oh, it was worth it. And I think that at the end of this first book in the trilogy, when Chas is, like, killing TIE fighters and killing TIE fighters, that's all she wants to do. And Will gets through to her and says, Chas, this is now a rescue mission. We have to change. She fights it, but then eventually she acknowledges it, gives up the glory of the battle, and goes to help save people. I think that's the beginning of her, of her switch. Because so all we have to do... All we have to do is have her get her legs cut off. All right, fly her B wing up into like a stormy planet, yep. climb up on top of the on top of it, and be like screaming at the sky yep. to get struck by lightning. That's exactly. You know it. the legs cut off. The legs cut off thing seems like a big jump, but it's really not in Star Wars. <laughs> Dude, that I'm happens saying, sometimes. There's no way that everyone <laughs> keeps all their limbs through three books, right? Like, come on. <laughs> like, someone's gotta, like Kairos loses like a finger, and it's like, oh no. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, basically. Yeah, so I think I think that she definitely had wishes of martyrdom because she she had survivor's guilt doubled over. Like it was pretty pretty intense. But I think yeah. at the end of this book, she finally realized, okay, she did one mission where she could put that aside to help the cause, and I think the next two books are going to be her reckoning with that more and more. And maybe, maybe if we if the Polinius Cinder operation happens, like we think. When Will decides to go a little crazy, maybe then she's the one that said, hey, no, you're the one that told me it's about the mission, about the squad. You, you're not allowed to go sacrifice yourself because you didn't let me do that. And maybe she's the one that has to bring him back. I think someone's got to bring Will back from darkness, and it's going to be either Chas or Nath. All right. All right. Fair enough. Um, so let's move on to Kairos, the final member of Alphabet Squadron, who I have a deep love for. You love she's Kairos. She's the wooing pilot. I mean, what what do we even know about Kairos? I'm not even really sure. She's pretty much a mummy in a helmet who kicks ass. Uh, that's that's about it. <laughs> yeah. Um, basically, she's the most mysterious member of the squadron, right? Mm-hmm. We we don't know much of anything about her. What are your predictions for her character, or or, or in your head, what is your head canon? Like, what? Who is she? What situation is she coming from? What species is she? Mm-hmm. What are you guys thinking about her? I, I hope she's a Tuscan Raider. Ooh! <laughs> that you know, would be I heard that so theory. cool. I heard that theory, actually, I think from the first time when I was listening to the Force Toast podcast, and they brought that up, because she has some some raps, right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, so Caitlin, Caitlin has been, I've been begging her to take my advice and read, uh, Caitlin's my wife, to read the, uh, all the books in our Utini foundational guide, right? So she's been, re- she's been listening to the audiobook of Kenobi. She's got like 45 minutes left. And we were painting our basement the other night and we were listening to it. And man, there's so much great sand people stuff in Kenobi. Yes. I forgot how much amazing sand people it's stuff there phenomenal. is. So I want, yeah. I want her to be a, I want Kairos to be a Tuscan Raider so bad. That would be so freaking cool. I don't know what I want from Kairos. I cuz on one hand I like the idea that she's a new character from like a an unknown species, but on the other hand, it's Star Wars and you have someone that is wrapped up completely, that's a mystery and you have two more books left. Like come on, like we we have to have a reveal at some point. Um but you know, there was a um there was a Jedi Tusken Raider at one point. Legends <laughs> have got you ever read too about crazy. this? Legends went too far. No. <sighs> I don't. I don't think it's like really well explained or anything. It's like reference, but I've seen. There's a Wikipedia article. We should find it and read about it. Oh, wait, no, no, that's in Kenobi. Yeah, is it? They say that the, that's how they know what Kenobi is. That long ago, one of the Jedi came and lived as a Tuscan, but had those powers. Yeah, that's in uh, Kenobi. That's that's not what I'm talking about. Oh. I'm talking about someone who was a Tuscan or originally was oh. a Jedi, like somehow was force sensitive, hmm. and they got him at a later age or something like that. I'll yeah. find it and talk to you guys about it. It's uh, interesting because like Tuscan Raider isn't really so much a species as like a life you come into, like yeah, Jedi. Right. Really, that's in and definitely of that's definitely sort of the vibe that Kenobi puts off. Like, yeah, yeah. Well, any, well, I won't spoil the end. Never mind. I'm not going to yeah, go there. But yes, right, Kenobi. Any <laughs> anyone could be a, a, a Tuscan Raider. But yeah. I think that ultimately, I, I I don't think Kairos is a is a Tuscan Raider. I think that she is. I mean, she's obviously humanoid. I think that based on her story that she told around the fire, which I got to say, one of my favorite parts of this whole book. I love the campfire. We're all gonna bond as a squad thing. Um, like said that the Empire came to her planet, lit it ablaze. I think she's covered in burns. I think that like literally mm. her her body was disfigured to an extent where if she's it's like a, almost a Vader esque thing, right? Yeah. Like if she's not she's wrapped up completely, if her skin's exposed, it could be just unbelievable pain. And mm. I think that um, someone on Twitter, I believe, said something about uh, like the butterfly comparison right like she's cocooned right now she's changing and she's altering inside so that her evolution can take place and maybe once her body's healed or her soul is healed or whatever they want to do with it in the second or third book she'll kind of emerge as something else wow but she's but she's a fascinating enigma man i mean she's she is a kick-ass warrior holy shit yeah no she really is but she she's pretty quiet Right? Yeah. She's, she's yeah. A she pretty speaks quiet, one, which character. is so weird. It's so weird because, like, like she she does talk to Quill. She like, can speak. Points. Like she is yeah. capable. Yeah. There's to Will. there are two which things. Is... There are two things that she is referenced as saying. One of them was right after Quell was hit pretty hard in the head. So you could say, 
you know, maybe she thought she heard this, but supposedly she says to Quell, make it right Mm -hmm. after they have like a little skirmish. And then the other time she says the emperor's shadow is long. Yeah. So So what if she's just like a crazy person? Like she doesn't actually need to like (laughs) talk and sign. She does that the whole campfire thing where she like explains her. I had so much trouble following that. Like I was just like, what the heck at all? I don't feel like I know anything about her character. It was cryptic. It was definitely cryptic. But she she can talk. Like maybe she's just like a weirdo. Like that one weird kid on the playground that like like, can't talk like a normal person. So he just acts all cryptic. I don't know. Well, so here's (laughs) my question. Crazy tangent. Karen Aiden. Right, he claims that he and I quote trusts Kairos deeply. So if their connection is so deep and he trusts her so much, why was why didn't he ever like consider Kairos to be the squadron commander? Is it literally because she refuses to talk? Dude, you, and yeah, she's she like, not a orders? commander. Are you kidding me? She has selective. She has selective mutism. Dude, are you kidding? Me? Okay. I, well, <laughs> oh my god, she'd be the worst <laughs> commander ever. <laughs> Listen, man, I think she'd be pretty good. Just follow my lead type of commander. Very Anakin Skywalker, you know? <laughs> yeah, Anakin Skywalker, except the personality is different and the skills are different and everything no, else no is quips. different. But other than that, you're so right. It's just like Anakin, Charles. <laughs> if everything was just different, then they're the same. <laughs> uh, <laughs> all right, on that note, on that note, I, I have a question about Kairos. Do you guys think that she has some type of special abilities? And I I don't mean force abilities per Mm -hmm. se, but just like a type of ability that the general person in the Star Wars galaxy doesn't have. And I'll I'll tell you just quickly why I'm asking this question is because what she did to the Imperials on page 217 when she saved Chas's life. Mm -hmm. Uh, I want to say they're on Abinito. I think so. I don't. I, I think that's correct. Yeah. It was described that what she did to them left them all with, and I quote, blackened, unrecognizable heads. And in the same scene, it was referenced that she has some sort of weapon that looks similar to a Wookiee bowcaster. Right. But yeah. It, they never really explain that. And I don't know if they will, but just what did what in the world did all of that mean? And what did you guys take away from that? There could be something. I mean... We've seen like night sister mm-hmm. magic. We've seen what if she's a fucking night sister, dude? Like <laughs> what if Kyro is a night sister? I, I've never liked the whole night sister subplot. What? So like yeah, I didn't. Like it's just I don't like There's this weird switches. Yes, it's so weird and creepy and I don't know, they're too creepy, man. I don't like oh. them. I hope she's not a night sister. Oh. It would be a good it would be a good story arc though. Yeah, like she's and she has that weird kind of ethereal voice going on. Yeah, it's because they're so hissy. That's why I don't like them. They hiss when they talk, and it's weird. She's hissy. She we hiss. are the night sisters. Yeah, and like, and like, her clothes are always moving. <laughs> yeah, maybe that's it. Maybe what she's what she's doing with her circles is when the the separatists came to Dathomir and destroyed it. Maybe she's just like a totally normal person, and she just takes her helmet off, and she's like, "Huh, oh, got him." Or guys, maybe she's Boba Fett. Oh my, oh my gosh! <laughs> Takes off the helmet and you're like, "Surprise! It's me!" You, you heard it here first. Kairos, Kairos is Boba equals Fett. Boba Fett. But no, to answer, wants, answer your, to answer your question, Charles, saying she's like Anakin, but he's saying <laughs> yes. she is Boba Fett. <laughs> exactly. You heard it here. And to answer your question, Charles, I would be surprised if she has some sort of special abilities. I just figured okay. that, like, I thought I kind of, I kind of interpret that as just like she's. You know, a savage. Cr- yeah, yeah. yeah that's Ra- raw brutality. Just raw brutality. Exactly. Exactly. Right. Or she's right. Cloud. Maybe she's Cloud from from Episode what? Nine. What? I'm what are so you talking about? The big that slug. Just... <laughs> the big slug oh. that hangs out with Snap Wexley. Oh, is it Cloud? I've been saying Claude. Ah, uh, Claude's right. I think you're right. Okay. What are you talking Dude, about? I'm still Eric, know what you're talking about. When you said that. It it struck me just like the line from Anchorman, I love Lamb. <laughs> Are you saying things? <laughs> she is Cloud. Okay. She is above us. Whatever you say, man. Kairos, Cumulus, wake up. Come on, they're the same thing. <laughs> All right. Now, for the sake of time, there are literally so many more characters we can go through. I'm going to ask you guys a quick fire question about several other characters. Right, real that fast, I let's just go. I want to touch on briefly, okay? Karen Aiden... 
first of all, great to see another Balasar, just like Elon Slees Bagano, who's the Death Sticks guy yep. from uh, from Attack of the Clones. <laughs> oh, yeah. That is the it's same, same yeah. species. Same I have not put that together until just now. Yeah, you know, do you want to buy some Death Sticks? <laughs> well, I, I was some waiting for missions? one of you to do an impersonation, so thank you. It's so good. Um, I want to go home and rethink my life. <laughs> I guess. Yeah. So here's do my I. question. So do I. What is Aiden's ultimate goal? Is it to be right, or is it for the New Republic to be victorious? Those are the he's two a, he's an I'm arrogant doing. prick. He doesn't care about the New Republic at all. He just wants the he wants he wants intelligence to be important, and it's not as important as it as he thinks it is. Yeah, he wants to be in charge. Yeah. He he wants the glory. He wants the New Republic to s- succeed. Yes, but he also wants the glory. Yeah. Ooh ooh ooh. Okay, he is the he's the alliance equivalent of Director Krennic. Yes. Yeah. Perfect. I have nothing to add. That, that's what that that's what that he is. Like he up. wants to be powerful, but he's not quite qualified. For Perfect. It. Not for military action anyway. He Aiden drove me nuts the whole book. Like his his sort of his entire mentality of wanting to like control everything drove me nuts. Like we stand yeah. here amidst my achievements, not yours. Like that's exactly that's who he exactly. is. Exactly. Okay, all right, let's talk about Aiden's buddy ITO. So this was a torture droid who was basically retrofitted into becoming a therapist. So what did you guys like or not like about that idea or that character? Caitlin thought it was, my wife Caitlin thought it was funny because she is a therapist, like in real life. And also a <laughs> torture droid. Like, <laughs> yes, also a torture <laughs> droid, yes. Um, do you guys remember, I think it's KOTOR 2, I think, where you like briefly play as a as a droid that's similar to the torture droid? Have you guys played KOTOR 2? Mm-hmm. Yes. Okay, so there's like, I forget what his name is, I think he's got a G in it, but he's like some sort of crime boss thing or something, like, it, I can't remember the details, it's so, it's such a weird, convoluted subplot, but you, I think you briefly play as that, or something like that. Is this I don't remember that, but it's been it's been so long since I've played KOTOR 2. Yeah, that's the same for me, I, KOTOR is on the iPhone and stuff, so I played it recently, you yeah. know, like, in the last couple of years, but KOTOR 2 I've not played since I was in like middle school, so... But anyway, I thought it was cool. I mean, I liked all the commentary about how awkward it was to get therapy from a torture droid. Yeah. That was fun. Yeah. Yeah, he was he was a therapist, but he was kind of still a torture droid to quell. Yeah, no, sort of. I know. I, I love that. I dig it because I'm like, yeah, you got to repurpose that tech. Like, it's a lot of technology and it's a lot of useful stuff. And he can, like, administer True. syringes and shit. Yeah, no, I liked. I really liked the character, and I really liked by the end of it how it he was kind of trying to balance the I need to be a therapist, but I also am kind of become your friend. Like it's, yes. the, it's that droid thing. Like all droids have semblance of personality, and by the end of it, I really did feel like he was a friend to Erica, and I really dug that. I agree with you, and and I want to submit this to you guys. Ito is second only to Will Lark in this book in terms of how much he cares. Which is, which is very strange for a droid, especially a torture droid, right? But I'm going to just leave you with this quote for him. On page 180, he's talking to Quell. He says, Erica, please sit. When she asks him why, he says, I'm not your friend, but I am concerned for your well-being, and I've committed to helping if at all possible. And then he says, I understand what it means to change. And I just that line struck me as so deep from a freaking torture droid <laughs> and that's the kind of stuff that would just randomly drop in this book that i loved so much yeah yeah it's great all right Hera Syndulla, we're, we we have to at least mention her she was in this my one question for you is quell asks Hera if being a soldier is worth all that it costs and Hera responds by saying look around you erica the answer is all over what does that mean and what does that tell us about Hera Syndulla? i think it means oh man people wouldn't People wouldn't be there if it didn't. Like the idea of we're now the new republic. We're no longer the rebellion. Like we, people are here because they want to. People are here for a new start. People are finding purpose. And if you have to ask if it's worth it, then you then you don't understand kind of all the progress that they've made. So I think that's what it means for yeah. for Hera. It's always meant it. It's always been worth it. And now that they're starting to see a few results. I think that it's really helping. Yeah, I would totally agree with that. I, I will we'll say too that Alexander Free totally na- nailed Hera Sindua in this book. Like better than a New Dawn. 
I'll say that. Yeah, I think she's spot on to her character. Like it, uh, especially right after having finished Rebels. Yeah. Like and it's ten years post Rebels, right? I think there's a timeline. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I thought it felt very much like her character, and I truly pictured her in my head talking when she had dialogue. Yeah, it was fantastic, it was and it was funny listening to the audiobook. Uh, Saskio, she didn't do a Vanessa Marshall impression at all necessarily but she still got the vibe of Hera and I, I was a little worried about that because with the an- animation characters it can be tough in audiobook because you're like I've heard this character for so many hours like Corey especially with your rewatch recently but I thought it still worked out very very well so props to her on that audio agreed yeah that's very cool um let's talk about Devin he's the last character I want to touch on uh Devin spoiler alert spoiler, spoiler alert, alert spoiler alert spoiler alert spoiler alert spoiler alert uh, everything's under control. Situation normal. Uh, everything's fine here now. Um, how are you? <laughs> so Devin is major. Is I'm sorry. Is it keys or Kreese keys or keys? Soren All keys. Right. All right, Soren keys. He is keys. I'm a bit confused about the character and exactly. I think I know where it's headed, but I, I'm I'm questioning what his motivations are because throughout this book, Devin seemed to be doing some anti-imperial things and some anti. New Republic things, but then at the very end of the book, he kind of decides to go back to Shadowing. Mm-hmm. Why did he do that, and what is his motivation, and where is this going? Dude, I think he just—I think he's tired of running, man. Yeah, exactly. Dude, that reveal was was awesome. Like, I, that was—I turned was. the page and I was like, "What?" And it's—it it is yeah. it was such a good cliffhanger when I get to the next book because I was so—I was a little confused about the Devon chapters. I'm like, cool. Yeah, man, I, w- I will say the Devon chapters are very classic Alexander Freed. Like <clears throat> Twilight Company is basically nothing but these, mm-hmm. right? Like it, that's and that's th- that's th- that's why Twilight Company is very hard to read for a lot of people because it kind of feels like a lot of short stories that don't make sense until the end, kind of like a uh, uh, Pulp Fiction, right? Yeah. Like it's, it feels yeah. like it's out of order almost. And that's how this was too. I remember reading that first chapter and like getting or the first chapter that Devon is mentioned in and like getting. Like pretty far into it before realizing that the plot has completely gone off the rails. Like it has nothing to do with what's happening at large. I'm like, what is yeah. this? Like, who is this character, and why am I suddenly reading about him randomly in the middle of this book? Yeah, but I'll tell you, once you get that reveal, because as I said on the last episode, after I finished reading it, I immediately went back into the audiobook. Those Devon chapters get really dope once you know it's keys, because you're like, hmm. oh, because the first one he's really trying to be like on the quote-unquote rebellion side. I'll be a good guy. All right, that didn't work fine. And then he goes a little... Yeah, he's he's such a badass, too. Yeah, he's such a badass. And then he goes a little more imperial. No, and I think that once we find out the twist with Erica, when he was the one that told her, hey, you need to run. You don't have the stomach for this at all. I will also leave. I don't agree with it, but I can stick it out a bit longer, you know? I think that he thought, okay, I'm going to leave because everyone says, just start over. If you go out of here, Mm -hmm. you won't be hunted. And he found out that was bullshit, both from the Imperials and yeah. from the Rebellion. So he's like, you know what? Yeah, Fine. Sure. I tried to leave. I tried to do what you wanted me to, but you're going to try to kill me anyway. So I'm going to go back to the one thing I was good at. And right. we're definitely going to get that confrontation between him and Erica. I would assume in like oh, yeah. the second half of the next book, she's going to discover like he's the one now running Shadowing. Yeah. I think he's going to be a very formidable opponent yes. too. Like, uh, I think he's going to be a great villain. I can't wait yeah, to see. Yeah, because it. he also doesn't have like the moral superiority of like what the Empire is doing is right. Like, he's not a uh, a Ray Sloan type character, right? He's like, yeah. no, I know this is messed up, but it's all I got. So, sorry, I'm going to use my brilliance to destroy you, and he will. Yeah. And yeah. I am. Yeah. I'm so excited for more Soren Keys. Agreed entirely. That is going to wrap it, though, for our character section. It's time for some major questions, guys. And I'm going to cut some out of here, too. I'm going to cut some out of here, too, because I could literally do a part three and part four, (laughs) but we're not going to do that. So here we go. We'll do the sequels. The Hellions Dare, uh, which was the the ship that Riot Squadron and Hound Squadron were based out of, was essentially followed by Imperial forces through hyperspace, just like in The Last Jedi, Mm -hmm. right? So, with that in mind, why were the New Republic forces so shocked in The Last Jedi when it happens, if that has happened to New Republic military before? And I'm going to ask you on top of that, not not to throw any shade on The Last Jedi because I love The Last Jedi, but did you prefer the Oradol Cluster 
way in this book that that being followed through hyperspace happened as opposed to what we saw in the running out of fuel Mm -hmm. uh you know scenario in tlj i think in tlj it's confusing because the 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 sequence that they use to track people in this book requires that they leave a ship behind after the coordinates are transmitted right in last jedi no one got left behind they all jumped and then first order jumped suddenly showed up so they didn't have anyone left I think that's why it's confusing. That being said, I did prefer this book's explanation of that. I, I yeah. love the idea that it was very practical. Yeah, and and it's also way harder. Like you need I way more skill pilots. Like yeah, yeah. It the was, fact that it was really you cool. you need to know when the ships are preparing for light speed. You need to know when the ships will have the coordinates, and then you need to have the skill to disable the ship with your Tie Fighters while not killing it, so that so that the computer right. is still intact. Like. Well, yeah. I mean, if cool. you're if you're gonna if you're gonna force me to talk about one of the major plot holes of the last shit, <laughs> I hey, listen. We're we're a positive community <laughs> of fans, and we really should not crap on the last Jedi as much as possible. But all being said, taking into account the expanded universe, the choice to make the hyperspace tracking a thing in the last Jedi, in my opinion, was a mistake. Like, there's not. Uh, tracking through hyperspace is not a new concept. It's done in Legends a lot. Like they can like by using like ion. Uh, I don't know what you call it. Like it's like the residue. trace that they leave behind when they jump yeah, to hyperspace. Yeah, exactly. Like and... they've like that's happened a lot in the books where they can like kind of calculate the most probable places that they would end up, and then yeah. based on the direction that they jumped in and stuff. That's why in Legends is why they do so many jumps. Like mm-hmm. if you have to outrun the Empire, you randomly jump a bunch of times because it's hard to trace your eye on yeah. whatever. I think for Last Jedi too, because like I, I agree. Like I think Last Jedi worked. Because you can go through that level of detail in a book. I don't want to watch a movie with that scene, Mother of God. Yeah, it just, it makes <laughs> it so. It, it, it's just it's a. It, I think it's. I think that. I think the whole hyperspace tracking and the jump to light speed and kill the entire fleet. Those are both very very dangerous precedents to set for Star Wars. <laughs> like now it's in the film, yep, so it's canon. It's so like, does that mean that we can never ever see a space chase in Star Wars canon ever again? Because now hyperspace tracking is a thing. So unless they canon the idea that somehow that technology was destroyed and nobody could figure it out again or like, also like only the first orders like lead destroyer had it like i think i think we it's right. still like very elite level technology like we right, also right. have like, canonized um armor and stuff that stops lightsabers but it doesn't mean everyone's got right. it true right it's just I, I i hope going forward we're able to <laughs> re- recover is is too strong of a word and too negative a word i, I don't mean recover from that but i just hope that i hope that in the future that hyperspace tracking is done the way that it's that it's done in alphabet squad yeah it has a very practical explanation like you know they they all converge on one guy right before they jump to light speed to steal the coordinates out of their data computer that's genius all right it was very tactical and done well and you know i hope it's just not like oh we can't escape to light speed anymore i hope that's not really well done for you i agree i agree all right, now the name Skywalker, which I, I, are you guys familiar with that? Have you? I've have heard you it heard before. It's, that's the that that's the Chiss kids, right? Yeah, something. Yeah, yeah no, exactly. no, no. That this is the kid. This is the one from the desert planet. I think. Yeah, him but too. I'm not certain. Wait, Jedi? Him too. No, the other uh, one. Geonosis. No, the yes. other one. Yes, <laughs> not Geonosis. Not Geonosis. Not Jedi. Pasana. No, no, the other one. Jakku. No, the other uh, one. Uh, all right. All right. <laughs> no, 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 no. You're, 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 you're thinking of tot of, of tots tween. Oh, tots. Tot, 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 tot tween. Little children, little tots. Okay. So, side <laughs> note, really fast. What the hell is up with Anakin not being able to pronounce his own planet's name? When does that? Why happen? does he say he says Tatooine always? What? Why does he say tot? He says Tatooine over and over again. It's obviously Tatooine. When does he what ever does he say Tatooine? I honestly don't remember. No, he says it. Tatooine. He says it multiple times in the films. He calls it Tatooine. It's like, why? I'm not sure. All right, when I do my re- when I do my uh, episode nine rewatch, I'm going to figure that out, and I'll get back to you. Just wait. Just wait for it. It's one of my complaints about the dialogue in the in the prequels. That's it. That that's the only Tatooine. thing that's wrong with the dialogue in the prequels. <sighs> That's the okay. one thing we found. All Listen, right. we've already right. talked about the Last Jedi. We can't start talking about the dialogue in the prequels. For the record, for the record, I love all of it. Now, I do too. I, I, hate, I hate light speed tracking. 
It's coarse. <laughs> and it gets everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> God. All right. Ask your damn question about Star or uh, Skywalker, so the Charles. Name, the name Skywalker <laughs> is pretty casually dropped a few times mm-hmm. throughout this novel. And my question for you is, do you think that there is a connection between some of these characters and the OT characters? And are we ever going to learn what those connections are? And, and what I'm going to present to you as my evidence for thinking that that might happen is on page 96 when Chas is talking to Will and she asks did you meet them Calrissian or Skywalker and it says she thought she saw a flash of hesitation in Will when she said Skywalker but Sadanik was too quick for her to comment so there's some recognition there we know he was at the Battle of Endor what's going on (laughs) Skywalker's Will's ex-boyfriend oh my god That could oh, happen. Right. It, it could happen. Oh my god, let's, guys, let's, guys, guys, guys. Let's not go there, Eric. You're too too far. No, Don't do it. Com- I'm just seeing the Twitter comments. I'm just like I imagining too. the I can too. Wild it's fire. no secret it's no secret that like there's like a gigantic Raylo like Twitter community. Oh, it's, it's like huge. It's it's huge. I can't wait to get somebody on the show that's like really more familiar with that than we are yeah. because like like there's like a there's like a a non let's just see them have sex on screen community like there's like <laughs> like there's like a real fan community that wants to see the story taken yeah. somewhere there is also a weird sort of fetish sex oh, thing community is, yes i'm not going to call anyone else specifically but some of the accounts that we follow i'm like wow wow anyway the point uh, that was a gigantic so, i'm so, so far Ray, off the rails Ray now Kylo equals Raylo then does does Luke and Will equal Skywalker Skywalker. <laughs> what are, what are we gonna Skywalker. call this? Wook. Uh, Will. Will. Will Walker. Sky Will. I don't Sklark. know. Clark. It's a good question. So uh, tweet at us your your <laughs> options. Uh, but no, I I think anyway. I think that, the the yeah. point. Sorry to take it off the rails. The point I was trying to make there is that like if if that ever became a thing, like people would freak out and oh, be yeah. obsessed with it, and then everybody else would be like screaming, "No, oh, that's a terrible idea." Star Wars is dead to me. Yeah, I'm like, let's burn my Nike shoes. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, no, I think that that's Luke. I think there's a, there's a definite chance that some of the people um, were maybe in Luke's squadrons post Endor. Because, I mean, he didn't just stop being a pilot immediately, I assume, you know. Or, I mean, he, he kind of still probably did a couple missions to help clean up and things like that. So I think their names are definitely known. I don't think anyone had, like, a super personal relationship with any of the OT characters, I don't think they would have gone that far. But I know one of the pilots, when they were talking about, um, when I die, who do I tell? One of them said, ah, I tell Skywalker. So I'm guessing, like, they were in his squadron at some point. Nothing mm-hmm. nothing really beyond that. I think they're they're just legendary characters. That, that is All a good right. question, though. Why did uh, why did Will sort of have that double take when uh, when that happened? That was I, I did notice that, too, and it was very interesting. Maybe yeah. he's a, he's a legend, you know? Like in Last Jedi, like, he's, his name gets whispered. After so many years, so maybe we get to the point where he's already kind of had that level of fame. Yeah. Yeah. Perhaps. All right. Final major question. And we touched on it last episode, but I want to know why do you guys think that the Emperor created Operation Cinder? And does it have anything to do with his suspected return in The Rise of Skywalker? Oh, my God. Wow. That's such a big question. It's that a big is, question. That's not. That's not just a big question. That is the, is the question. question. Right. The question. I don't know, man. I've been racking my brain ever since we first started talking about this. I mean, I listened to like part one. I listened to that episode this week when I was painting my basement, and like I was just kind of reflecting on why did Cinder happen? Like I brought that up, and I just I still don't know. Like it just doesn't make any tactical sense. Like. You know, the Empire is supposed to be like the Nazis, right? Mm-hmm. They're loosely based on them. They're called stormtroopers. That's originally mm-hmm. Nazi terminology. Like, Hitler's last orders for the Nazis were to go into the hills and, you know, wage guerrilla warfare. And that makes tactical mm-hmm. sense. Like, but Cinder makes no sense at all. I just cannot fathom a reason that really imperial loyal planets would be just blown to shit that just doesn't make any freaking sense to me like i can understand if operation cinder was like destroy all the enemies of the empire but that's not what they did they they burned all the loyal planets which just seems completely counterproductive and i cannot figure out a reason for it i think that it doesn't make sense if palpatine wasn't a sith lord i think that 
just politic. But he's not. Listen, I, I, you made that point yeah. last time. That he's it's like a crazy psychotic thing. But that's not his style, well, not, man. Not, Palpatine like is. I think that that, and I think there there is reason to it. Because if you're if you're just political and you just want allies that you don't care who they are, yeah, it doesn't make sense. But I think if Pal- Palpatine knew that if he dies, that means everyone surrounding him was not powerful enough to keep him alive, to keep the Empire going, and they need to be punished for that. I mean, this goes back to Bane. Like, if you're not strong, you deserve to be destroyed. And I think that Cinder is A, I mean, even the, the name of it, right? We need to go to Cinders, to Ashes. Like, it's a punishment mm-hmm. for everyone that failed, number one. Yeah. It's like literally force lightning to the galaxy. Like, he force lightninged his own apprentices a bunch of times as he was training them. It didn't matter if they were loyal. He's like, you failed. You deserve to be suffer. And then two, Cinder makes me think of ashes and it's like Phoenix rising from the ashes is like, yeah, that's a really it's good paving point. the way for the, for what we're assuming is the first order who are like the neo-Nazi equivalent, right? Um, right. To then rise later. Cause you can't, he didn't want empire two cause the empire failed. That is done. We now have right. to rise. Right. It's like, it's like Bane destroying the whole Sith to create the rule to you. I mean, it's kind of start from scratch. Yep, right. I guess that's I can kind I, of see that. that. That's, that, that's, a, that's a very good, that's the best theory I think I've and heard I so think, far. I, th- I agree. I think there's a possibility that we're going to see some of the red robe messengers in episode nine. I think that might be how we see Palpatine instead of in a, in a uh, physical appearance. Because we, we're seeing him in I, Alphabet Squadron. We see him in Aftermath. We see him in Battlefront 2. Like, I think that I might be it, what we see. I, I want and I think we're actually going to see him come back. Maybe not like in a corporeal form, maybe in like a weird force ghost spirit mm-hmm. type of form because the Sith are so like enamored with the idea of of not dying and mm-hmm. not giving up their power, yeah. right? And if anyone actually accomplished that, I think it would be Palpatine or Sidious. Yeah. And here's what I think that he was doing with Cinder. This is my only thought. I think he was trying to figure out who was truly loyal to the empire like who even after he was gone was still loyal to the idea of of him and his rule because he knew that he was going to come back and when he came back he wanted to have this refined version of only those people who were literally obeying the orders of who they thought was dead they're that dedicated to him they're that loyal and these are the people that he wants to try to lead to retake the universe and retake his throne that's not bad because, yeah, like, if you, that's legwork. Essentially, when you're gone, like, death won't stop your obeying my orders. So now I'll trust you and you will then inherit my my riches. Exactly. Now, on that note, I want to leave you guys with ITO's uh, theory because I thought it was incredibly interesting and very well said. So on, uh, I have it here. He says, can I offer my theory? The answer is simple. The emperor who ordered Operation Cinder, who built two Death Stars, who oversaw countless genocides and massacres and created an empire where torture droids were in common use, was not a man of secret brilliance and foresight. He was a cruel man, petty and spiteful in the most ordinary of ways, and spiteful men do spiteful things. Whatever else he intended, that is at the root of it all. And then Quell says, he ruled the galaxy for over 20 years. Everything we are is because of him. How do we get past that? And ITO says, Erica, that's what we're all here to find out. I wholly Beautiful. disagree with him, man. I wholly disagree with it. Like, I just, like, like Eric, the reason I jumped up so much because a minute ago you said something, and I was like, no, he's not psychotic. Mm-hmm. Like, in the first, in the first part one of our little talk about Alphabet Squadron last week, we, like, you, you briefly mentioned something along those lines that, like, mm-hmm. he's, he's evil and psychotic and just wants to destroy everything. And that is ITO's theory. And I'm just like, that just seems so unlike. Papa Palpatine, man. Like Pop Papa Palpatine, Pop read read Darth Plagueis, man. Like he is so calculating, mm-hmm. like in True. in planning. Like he doesn't have a like that's that's how he's different than the other Sith, right? He doesn't have yeah. a cruel for the sake of being cruel bone in his body. Like even Bane did. Like like he would just be evil, he, even though he a lot of times he said things like he said like you shouldn't just be cruel for the sake of being cruel, but he did stuff that was fairly cruel for the sake of being cruel. And Palpatine is just not like that. Like I, I would just find it very hard to believe that he's just like, you know, bird fingers up, screw you guys. If I can't be powerful, nobody else can either. Let's just burn all the planets. That just does not seem like Palpatine to me. I guess we'll find okay. out in December. 
In we in in descend in descender descender descender. Do you guys do you guys think we're gonna get get Cinder mentions like in the film? You think that's gonna happen? I I honestly so, so with episode no. nine, my thing is I'm I'm honestly trying to speculate as little as possible, which isn't the best thing to say in a Star Wars podcast. But because I feel like the more I speculate, the more I'll get attached to something that I want. And then regardless of quality of the film, I'll be disappointed because my own personal thing didn't come true. <clears> and I hate that. Yeah, I've never bought into that. I mean, I will oh, read a lot of people don't and stuff, do it. But... I, me personally, I know I will do that. <laughs> it's dumb. Yeah. All right, guys. So I do have some connective tissue, if you will, quote, unquote, slash Easter egg, slash new canon things to run by you. <laughs> Rapid fire, and then we're done. Round us out. We always do these. I thought you were going to say some connective tissue on my scrubs, and I got to go <laughs> oh, shower God. up and stuff. Gross. <laughs> Yes, well, uh, put air quotes around that. All right, <laughs> we do this every time we're going to do it. Number one, Sadanik, uh, who was one of Will's co-pilots in Riot Squadron, mentions reclaiming Coruscant for the New Republic. Now, we haven't seen that story in canon, but it is, it is a major, major plot point in the Legends X-Wing series. So that was a huge shout out to that. Um, mm, yeah, on page 78, the corporate sector, a.k.a. Corsec, is mentioned as featured in the Ooh. Han Solo adventures. I don't yeah. know if that was his first canon nod, but it is at least a canon nod, mm-hmm. and I thought that it was awesome. It might be. Isn't, isn't Corsec kind of like this really cool like FBI, CIA type of police force out of Corellia? Isn't that right? The corporate sector is like – it was like a non, non-government-related like, – uh, sector of space that Han Solo operated in, like during yeah. the Brian Daly series. The corporate series. sector was, yeah, but Corsac Corsac was also Corellian security. Corsac yes. is Corellian, like security forces or something yeah. as yeah. well. Yeah, I yeah, think. Okay. Yeah. The, yeah, those are super cool. I always really like the like like the mention of Corsac. I feel like there's like a big character in Legends. It's totally blanking on who Corin it is. Corrin Horn. Like a, Corrin Horn. No, it's literally not Corrin just Horn. <laughs> that, that's. Oh His entire God, right. backstory is he worked for Corsair. It Corsair. is Corrin Horn. Oh, God. Yeah, you're, I forgot about that. I really to black out that. I have. I have wiped it from my brain. I did like that part about Corrin Horn's backstory that he was a, like a detective kind of yeah. guy. Yeah, yeah. All right. Too bad, too bad the book that he's in absolutely blows. <laughs> oh, jeez. All right, moving on. <laughs> the Emperor's Messengers, as we discuss, as seen in Battlefront 2, heavily featured in this book. Very cool to see some more from them. You know what? It was even cooler though. Pod racing yeah. mentioned several times yeah, in this book. That's true. I still want my pod racing novel. They actually referenced that uh, there was a pod race on the planet Cantonica, which is where Canto Bite is located. So that's really that cool. Is. That is um, true. Page ninety six. Freed totally broke the fourth wall whenever he had a character say, and I quote, "A long time ago, now far away from here." When he was starting the <laughs> story, awesome. Uh, that's totally a reference to how every movie opens, of course. Um, The White Book was mentioned, which is the New Republic's book of rules and regulations that was mentioned in Freed's other novel, Twilight Company. Mm -hmm. So it got some continuity there. Admiral Ray Sloan is mentioned in this book on page 105. She's so great. Yeah, on page 120, an astromech droid who has a 20-character serial number compressed down to D6L. My question is, does that mean that R2-D2 and C-3PO are also compressed names? Do they have full names that we don't know? Oh, I, I think so, I think so. Actually, I, I, I might be on Wikipedia. I'm curious. I didn't know this, and if that's the case, tweet at us. Yeah, R2 is his R2 Nerodo. That's his full yeah. name. Please call him R2. Page 147. Chief of Intelligence Kraken is mentioned. Kraken is actually a longtime Legends character, including in the X-wing series, uh, but he was actually brought into canon. There was a rebel on board the Millennium Falcon in ROTJ who was retroactively designated to be the character of Kraken. I don't know if you guys oh, know no. this, awesome. but what? Yeah. That's okay. You got to explain that further. What are you talking about? That, I mean, that's that's the extent. So Kraken became a major Legends character, and then it ended up just becoming retconned essentially that one of the characters in the Falcon in one of the movies that is Kraken. <laughs> like that's the guy that plays Kraken. But that was not who he was hired to play. He was just a guy that was there. Well, yeah, because all yeah, this continuity okay. is honestly George didn't know any of this shit in the eighties. Like, come on. No. No, there's there's forty something years now of, of crap. Like, I yeah. mean it can't be continuity. Yeah. No, no, not at all. All right. 
Nurris, uh, or the grandmother, always calls the rebels separatists or the New yeah, Republic separatists, that was cool. which makes sense. But it's just a, I've always thought of it as a very specific prequel term referring to Dooku yeah, and you know his faction, the, C- the, the CIS, the, the Confederation yeah, of Independent Systems. Systems. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, page one seventy. Hera specifically mentions how much she misses the crew of the Ghost, which was just heartbreaking. Mm-hmm. Uh, page 211, Avert Pine is mentioned, and I was thinking that might yeah. be a little bit of an homage to uh, Rogue Squadron because they had a Verpine mechanic in that book. Probably. Mm. That's true. Um, yeah. On page 225, uh, Freed uses the word restroom. Since when are they no longer refreshers? refreshers. <laughs> oh, that's so true. Holy crap. Somebody yeah. screwed up. He screwed that's that up. They're always refreshers in so Star now, Wars. Now there are restrooms as well. Maybe there are literally wow. rooms for rest. Guys, my childhood you is still, ruined. Uh, I'm telling you. Mine is, you, my, mine is too. You. I think I'm done with that Star Wars it. now. It's been fun. 13 episodes. That's all we got. All right. Last ones, last ones. Hera's call sign is Spectre 1 in this novel. So now we have had Hera involved with the Ghost, the Phantom, and now Spectre. Very cool. All synonyms for each other. Love that. That's true. Um, Now, finally, page 368, Chas says, maybe she could get inside, rip through the thing. She was talking about another ship. I should probably probably make that clear. They were around the campfire. They were drinking a bit. (laughs) Oh, my God. These sound like rap lyrics. (laughs) Okay. <laughs> oh my god. All right, I'm going to get through this. She's talking about another ship. She says maybe she could get inside, rip through the thing like a bullet. <laughs> Sorry, Go rap, on. Rap lyrics. <laughs> like a bullet from a slug thrower. She was talking about flying her ship through another ship to destroy it. And I thought that that was maybe some foreshadowing <clears throat> sure. um, to Holdo's maneuver Absolutely. in The Last Jedi. So that's all I got. That is all your connective tissue, Corey. Uh, slash <laughs> this is not on your scrubs. It is in episode 13. Canon. That is right. And with that, I will round out this round table. Well, I have a, what, one last thing I want to talk about really quick um, today that occurred because you brought up continuity. I meant to bring this up to you guys earlier. Yeah. And I thought of it, thought of it today. So um, I've been listening to uh, the Revenge of the Sith novelization for uh, several weeks mm-hmm. now. Like as occasionally I'll get in the car, be in the mood to listen to it. I'll listen to it. I was listening to it today working in the basement. And um, the I, I got to the scene where Obi-Wan is on, on Utapau and he is uh, seeing the – What's the what's the creature called? The rides? Do you guys oh, know? Not off the top of my head, but I know what you're talking about. Is it EOP? It's not an EOP. No, that's what I'm no, that's no. different. Yeah, okay. Anyway, I can't remember. Anyway, so that's the same thing he rode in Master and Apprentice, is it not? Yes, correct. it is. Yeah. Yes. So it was very interesting seeing like an author's description of Obi Wan meeting that animal for the quote unquote first time because up until that point the, the continuity was that had not been done yet right so right. now Master and Apprentice has made it that Obi Wan rode one of those as a much younger like Padawan yep. right so in Revenge of the Sith he's not he already I mean, knows it, that 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 same scene occurs but like. It's a big continuity issue, and I, that that totally occurred to me today. That that's, like that's interesting though, because the books are like essentially canon unless they directly contradict what's in the film, right? But right. now that everything right. is canon, are they canon unless they directly contradict the other canon? Yeah, I, I think that I think that in this instance, I think that they would give Master and Apprentice. Wait, how does that how does would. that contradict it? He doesn't have a scene where it doesn't it doesn't contradict it. It's just. The language used and the way that the scene plays out is obviously Obi-Wan has never seen one of these creatures before. Oh, right. okay. I hear what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. So like, but that's definitely the same thing he wrote in, in, uh, in Master and Apprentice, which well, is also, super I interesting mean, to me. Grievous goes like, Obi-Wan, I've been training your Jedi arts by Count Dooku. And after the Clone Wars, Obi-Wan should be like, yeah, I know. We fought like 20 times. <laughs> like there's yeah, no exactly. reason for Grievous to like grandstand because they fought so much already. So <laughs> yeah, that's totally true. Totally oh, true. yeah. But that'll do it. For- my shameless, my shameless plugs for uh, Revenge of the Sith in this yeah. episode because I have to talk about it every episode. Apparently. Yeah. So uh, let's do um, our final. Now that we've talked about it, rankings and Alphabet Squadron again. Charles, I don't remember what your original score was. It was a uh, eight. You gave it an eight originally. Eight. You gonna stick? It with was that? an eight, and and I I'm sticking with an eight. I. I felt pretty strongly like, you know, I really like certain aspects and others I wasn't as big a fan of. But overall, highly positive experience reading this book. I'm sticking with my eight. All right, Corey, you're at a 6.5. 
Yeah, I will also stick with my 6.5. Like, I, I definitely understand why you guys liked it as much as you did. But there were several scenes that I was just not nearly as crazy about. Um, but, you know, everybody's got their own stuff they love in Star Wars. Totally. And Master and Apprentice was my 10 out of 10 for me. So I, I totally get yeah. it. All right. And I did a 9.5, and I'm going to stick there as well. Um, That's never happened before. Yeah, right I know. Now, we've never all stuck at the exact same one. But, yeah, so that's our Alphabet Squadron. The next one of these is going to be Thrawn Treason, which comes out next week, dudes. It is. Oh, my God. It comes out next week? We still don't have our advanced copies? What is happening? So we'll do Thrawn Treason and then uh, Galaxy's Edge Crash of Fate. Then Galaxy's Edge Black Spire all come out before the end of August. So well, I'm glad that we have so many books coming because I have too much free time. I don't know what to do with it. <laughs> Clearly. You're going to have to fill those hours, my friend. Uh, but but stay tuned for those. Uh, we Again, we do these roundtables about 30 days after book release. So if you want to follow along with us, the Thrawn uh, Treason Roundtables will happen near the end of August with the Galaxy's Edge book roundtables happening in uh, September. And that'll do it. Because we did it yet again somehow. This week's episode of The Living Force. If you are new to the show, don't forget to subscribe wherever you get your podcasts and tune in every week to hear us at Utini talk about the Star Wars Expanded Universe. Please do leave us a review on iTunes or wherever you listen to help people find us and head over to utini.com for reviews, articles, and comprehensive book profiles on every single story in the Star Wars galaxy. Especially Alphabet Squadron, we have a review up right now. And if you've read it, go leave your community ranking on the book's page. Yes, that's actually a really important point that we mean to talk more about on the show. Listen, all of our books on utini.com have a whole comment section, a community section where you can leave your review, and your review is automatically tied into the calculation of the star ranking that the community gives. So listen, if you have read Alphabet Squadron, please go to our website, utini.com, um, and you can find Alphabet Squadron either in the timeline or by searching for it. And then leave your comments. Get, tell us what you thought about the book uh, under the profile page. If you click on the book, it'll take you right to the book page. And give us your star rating. So I would love to see how the community feels about the book compared to how we as a team have rated exactly. it. Exactly. And this is also every single book and story in Legends and Canon. You can do this. So if you want to be the person that single-handedly is the community ranker for Hutini? You can go now and do every book you've That's ever true. read. And that is the official That's ranking true. until someone else comes along. Yeah, because there are very few books. We just haven't promoted it very much. There are very few books that, books that have a lot of uh, community interaction on them. So like, if you want us to talk about you on the show for having reviewed 150 books, then go do that. Yes. <laughs> uh, so if you want your thoughts on the show, in addition to your rankings, email us at livingforcepod at utini.com. Tweet at us at Living Force Pod or join our Uchini Discord community by going to utini.com slash Discord. Speaking of that, we want to wish a belated happy birthday to Brent Sweeting, who is one of our most active and awesome Discord members. It was this past yeah. week. I hope that was great, Brent. Thanks for all the things you do in the Facebook group and Discord. Finally, if you want to join Timothy on Patreon, which we talked about earlier, go ahead, head over to patreon.com slash Uchini. Like we said, we'll be adding content over there over the next few months when we do an official Patreon launch, but we absolutely appreciate any early support and help you can give if you feel inclined. You can find us personally on Twitter. I am at Eric Eilerson, Corey is at DocStarWarsMD, and Charles is at C. Henkel. Special thank you to Matt Davenport, our amazing editor, Freddie, our tech wizard, and Wes, our community manager. Thank you to Corey and Charles for podcasting with me this week, fellas. And as always, may the force be with you. There is no hatred. There is joy. There is no division. There is union. There is no apathy. There is passion. There is no gatekeeping. There is community. This is the Utini Star Wars fan code. Embrace it. Live by it. And above all, trust in the living force. That's all for this week. Join our community and surround yourself with like-minded fans by visiting us online at utini.com. Until next time, may the Force be with you. <laughs>